Hey guys, good to see you guys here on Facebook Live. I'm Jenny with Azura, and I'm here with Dr. Burkhart with the Pediatric Dermatology Office, who is right next door to Azura. We are keeping our distance, wearing our masks, but we wanted to bring you some information today about um, all things pediatric dermatology. So I'm going to give you um, the floor, and if you'll just introduce yourself, tell us about who you are, maybe a little bit about your practice, and go from there. Cool. Hey, I am Craig Burkhart. I'm a pediatric dermatologist. I was at UNC Chapel Hill for 11 years, and then I decided to start my practice here in Cary, North Carolina. Um, we see kids from 0 to 18, um, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm Jenny's neighbor, and so happy she included me on this uh, talk. Yeah, so you've been around, like you said, you've been around for a little while, and you just recently came to Cary, so we're super excited to have them next door. You know, for me, when we were talking about what you do and the complimentary services and things like that, um, you know, over at Azura and the Med Spa, you know, we see a lot of people come in with acne. And so acne is obviously an ongoing issue. You really can't necessarily cure, and it's an ongoing thing. And, it, you know, a lot of preteens and adolescents have to deal with acne. And when we had posted that you and I are having this discussion, that's probably the number one thing that the moms and the dads, you guys sent us questions in regards to acne. So um, I think that acne would be a great thing to talk about today. Um, we see it in our office just because like a lot of moms will bring the kids in and we do like acne treatments. And I always tell them, you know, like, this is a, a medical condition that also needs some medical management. So can you give everybody a, some information about just what is acne, why does it start, we start seeing that preteen years and kind of where it goes from there. Sure, okay. Yeah, so acne is an extremely common uh, adolescent disease, so lots of teens get acne. Um, it's mainly, I would say, the hormonal, um, the hormones are the main thing that cause acne. Not so much washing your face. Um, so a lot of people think if they just wash their face more, those little black dots will go away, but that's not going to work too well. Um, you need to add some things on, on top of that. So medical therapy, um, some of the other things I, I think you guys are doing over yeah. next door as well, too. Those, those can help, help out with the blackheads and, and that, that sort of, that, that part as well. Um, I, I come in more from the medical side of it, um, so mine's more about preventing scars and um, uh, preventing your acne from getting worse. Um, but, but sometimes it's nice to have some complementary therapies as well. So what would you say to a mom who's like, they have a 12 year old, they're starting to break out, they're getting little blackheads, they're getting some pustules, and they're really concerned. They're like, you know what, I had terrible acne as a kid, as an adult, I'm 43, and I still get acne, I don't want my kid, you know, I wanna, if I wanna try to jump on my daughter's acne who's 12, what would you tell parents would be the best thing they can do before they get to a dermatologist, like what they can start doing at home right now. Okay. Yeah, so of course there's over-the-counter therapies. So my favorite things over-the-counter would be benzoyl peroxide and salicylic acid. Those are an almost all over-the-counter acne products um, when you go to Walmart or Target, some things like that. Um, and then a new product out that's available for acne is different, so that's another um, ac acne cream that you could use as well. So doing those creams will help you out a lot. Um, Diet-wise, um, keeping a low-sugar diet will help a lot of people with acne. And then, uh, for some reason, low-fat milk makes some people's acne flare. So, um, although whole milk is not good for your weight, it might be better for your acne, and you'll have to kind of decide there. Is there some rationale to that? I mean, is there, like, can you explain that? Yeah, so, um, supposedly, I've not seen it happen in person, but when, when, when you take fat out of milk, you add a hormone to be able to take that fat out of it. And that hormone that they use to replace the fat or take it out um, is, is what flares some people's acne. Yeah, and so, you know, I get the question a lot of times, well, do, I, do you think that milk or, or gluten causes my acne? I don't really necessarily think it causes, but like you said, that it can initiate or make things worsen in some patients sometimes. Yeah, and I think any skin disease, having a healthy diet, yeah. good sleep and exercise will help any skin disease at all. Uh, just lowering the stress is a huge, huge factor in any skin disease. And so sugar, what's the thought process behind like lowering sugar in your diet? That one, I would not know the thought process behind that. Yeah. Um, but I do know a lot of people report um, chocolate, chocolate, cake, and things like that make their acne flare. And um, in, in the dermatology world, we feel it's more the sugar, not necessarily the chocolate. So. Right. Um, or it could be the fact that you're under a lot of stress and you're craving chocolate. Yeah, that too. <laughs> all those things, yes. Yeah, so. 
exactly. And then also that's the time for your hormones and acne and cycles and things like that. So, so many things. <laughs> and, and every person is an individual. So if you know something flares your acne, well, it just flares your acne. You have a choice. So um, one of the questions that one of, them, um, our, one of our patients sent in um, when we had posted that we were doing this together is about benzoyl peroxide. And so they were saying that, you know, benzoyl peroxide seems to work for my child, but it always stains everything. Yeah. You know, yeah. that, that's just, <laughs> it yes. works, right? So like I always say, you know, use white pillowcases, yeah. try to apply it at nighttime if they do yes. it in the day, you know, make sure they apply it, wash their hands. Do you yeah. have any other tips for that? Yeah, you can also try using a lower percent benzoyl peroxide. So benzoyl peroxide is sold somewhere between two and 10%. That's a little bit technical. Um, but, but if you stick in the two to 5% range, most of the time you're not gonna be doing great. When you go to the higher percentages, you're gonna get more dry skin and you get more bleaching of your clothing faster with, without more acne efficacy. So if it's me, I stick to that two to 5% um, and, and not, not go to the higher. So benzoyl peroxide, salicylics, they're yep. washing their face, they're using mm -hmm. gentle cleansers. Yes. And then, okay, my kid's acne is still not under control. And if you guys have any questions, feel free to post some questions and Tiffany will let us know. She's um, filming for us from a distance with her mask as well. So feel free to ask some questions. <laughs> so, so we've done the benzoyl peroxide, we've used the salicylic, mm -hmm. our kids are still concerned about mm -hmm. their acne, we're concerned, what's the mm -hmm. next step? Okay. Um. Well, you have, you have um, the choice to do medical therapies at that point, get, get prescriptions, um, or you can do um, some other complementary type things. Um, so I think you're more of an expert on the complementary than me, uh, but a lot of the alpha hydroxy acids, those things can help out a lot. Um, you, can, you can do, um, like, Dior has that nice little nose peel, um, black heavy mover, um, those sort of things can help you out in that end of, end of things. Um, one more complementary medicine that might help out is niacinamide, vitamin B3, so a lot of people think that helps if you make sure that's um, plentiful in your diet. So that's some, that's some complementary medicine type things you can do. Um, and in terms of medical um, treatments, um, one, you can go after the hormones. So I had a lot of teenagers um, who were taking birth control pills, the females, and then they switch over to um, implants or what have you, and then their acne flares. The pills do seem to help your acne a little bit more than those, those other products. Um, so you might want to look at how, how you're managing, how you're managing your hormonal control, um, and then you got to decide if you need a prescription cream or maybe an antibiotic temporarily to calm things down. Yeah. And so, at what point do you think like that grade of acne should? You know, for me, I mean, I had terrible acne, I had mm -hmm. terrible scars. My parents tried to get on mm -hmm. it, and um, it, it was very difficult. And so, you know, getting on an antibiotic is not something that they should delay if, yeah. if they're concerned about that. And yeah. so, like, what type of antibiotics typically would you use in acne, and how long do you think kids typically would be on them? Gotcha. Yeah. So, times when you want to be be more aggressive, I would say if it's in the temple area or it's in the cheeks, those are two areas that scar very, very commonly. So, you, you might want to consider being more aggressive at that point to prevent a pretty permanent consequence or something that requires procedures to correct. Um, and then the typical antibiotic orally that we use would be minocycline or doxycycline. Um, and these are, these are two types of antibiotics that you can, you can, um, you do not need to taper off of. So a lot of people are afraid once they go on antibiotic that once they start, they have to take every pill just as prescribed until the doctor says stop. Uh, but these are medicines that are safe enough when you're, when you're treating acne that you can stop cold turkey if, if you think you have any problems with it. Um, typically, an acne course will be about two to three months with the oral antibiotic. Some people need to be on it for a whole year. Um, if it's been a whole year, then you should really consider doing other options pretty strongly. So, and then there's other prescription medications that you would yeah. use that they don't yeah. have access to over the counter. Yeah. Um, so there's other prescriptions like Retin-A. I think yeah. a lot of parents are aware of those types of medications. Yeah. Um, and there are topical antibiotics that yes. you sometimes use as well. Yes. Right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then talk about one of the questions that someone sent in was, you know, for adults and for their teenagers, when you get those bad, painful cysts mm -hmm. under the skin, yeah. and even if it just flares up like monthly for women or for men that get them kind of larger on the neck or the backs, or yeah. is there really anything that they can do to try to get those to go away and don't pick 
<laughs> yeah, that's, that's the big thing don't I'm saying. Those. Yeah, don't, don't pick. So when I was first starting my residency a, a while ago, um, there was a movement to change nodular cystic acne's name to just nodular acne to prevent people from trying to pop them. Because if you pop it, there's not going to be a big bunch of goop coming out of there. You're just going to give yourself a scar. Um, I think that movement's ended. We still call it nodular cystic acne or whatever. Um, just because people like that term. But don't pick at it. Huge, huge point. Uh, things you can do. Um, well, if you can get an antibiotic from, from a physician, that's, that's great. That, that, that'll help you out. Um, you can do warm compresses. That, that can help out. Um, do you think like applying any of like the benzoyl peroxides or the retin-A yeah. or those kind of things just a little bit more concentrated in that area can help or it doesn't really get to that area? Yeah, that's a hard one. So, so I'd say the literature would not support that. Right. But as long as you don't irritate your skin too much, you can try it. <laughs> um, so I, I definitely, when I had acne, would put an extra benzoyl peroxide and clindamycin on my face. I, I, I thought it helped out. But I know when I look at reports, they say it doesn't help. Um, and sometimes yeah. they're just like over applying, over applying, yeah. over applying, and then the next thing you know it's all scabby, and then they're picking at that, and then they still have the cyst, yeah. and it's still... <laughs> do you do any catalog injections or anything like that? Sure, sure, yeah. So if you wanted to have something quick, done quickly, yeah, you can do a catalog injection. Um, you have to be gentle about it. Um, so if you go to put too much mess in there, you get a, a dent um, in place of your pimple. And that dent can last six months. Um, so it's not permanent, but, but, but it's not what you were expecting. So you have to be careful and maybe maybe um, allow your dermatologist to see you twice instead of just once for your injection. One time for a small dose, and if it didn't work, then go up a little bit more for the second visit. Don't, don't, don't go for 100% at the beginning. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you definitely get that atrophy in those very quickly and easily if it's overdone. Yes, don't overdo it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I've actually had that happen to myself. <laughs> yeah. And it does come back. You know, I say, you know, you're going to have, you know, I had the divot, but it does come back. But it takes some time. Yes, you know? yes. And you're like, oh, like you said, you've replaced this with a divot, so it's a pain. And then what about um, Accutane? You know, Accutane is always a hot button. Um, I, in, in Azura, at Azura, when parents bring their kids in, you know, sometimes I'll be like, you know, at this point, there's a lot of scarring. I'd love to help you with that, but you've got to get this acne under control. And I say, you know, have you ever thought about Accutane? And I took Accutane twice because I had terrible cystic acne. That's why I got into skincare and aesthetics was for that reason. And um, you know, I, it was a, it was a saver for me. Like it worked well, but obviously it's not for everyone. So a lot of times I'll mention, um, you know, maybe you want to talk to a dermatologist about this option, and then they're like, oh my gosh, I would never do that. So can you kind of talk about a little bit of the the myths of Accutane and the real the real worries versus the yeah, maybe not so much. Sure, yeah, so the most important thing about Accutane is if you're a female, don't get pregnant while you're on it. That is a very real risk, is if you're on medicine and you get pregnant, your baby can have severe birth defects. Um, so that's something we take really seriously and we call you like monthly pregnancy tests. Um, and we sign off about 30 times if you will not get pregnant, both the parent and the child, um, or if you're an adult, just for yourself. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that, that, that one's a real risk. Once you've been off the medicine for one month, that risk is no longer there. Uh, the medicine's been given to millions and millions and millions of people since 1979, and we know that once you're off medicine, it does not lead to birth defects down the line. Um, so, so I think you have some kids, yeah. and they're healthy and right. smart yeah, and, we'll and popular and all that. Exactly. <laughs> so, so, so it, it, it has not hurt, hurt you there. Um, the other big risk people worry about is depression or mood changes. Um, so that's also something we take very seriously, and that's why you come in once a month is just to watch for that. Whether it's true or not that people get um, depressed while they're on it um, is, is, is very much debated and pretty much believed not to be true, but we take it seriously. Uh, and I would say the big tip for parents about depression and teenagers is that most teenagers get more sassy if they're depressed. <laughs> they don't get mopey and withdrawn like adults do. So, so I would watch your child for sassiness just as much as with socially withdrawing and grades going down um, while they're in Accutane if you're going to watch for, watch for depression. Um, and if you ever think you're having a side effect from, from medicine when you're on it, if you do take it, um, just stop at cold turkey and tell your, tell your, your medical team and then they can, they can help you walk, walk through that see if it's um, playing a role. Um, you also have to remember that acne has a severe impact on teenagers' lives. Um, appearance is very important to a teenager. 
um, just to be able to fit in with their peers and um, ha have a very healthy um, experience. So um, you're going to have to balance the risk, the possible risk of depression there versus the possible risk of, of um, acne and scarring that can result. And I think too that if your child has, or even as an adult in the 20s, I mean even for myself in my 20s and early 30s, like when you've got acne that bad, it makes you feel depressed and you hang your head down and like, you know, you wear your hair over your face, which, you know, <laughs> not any better. And then once that acne starts to clear up, you see a lot of that self-conscious and that depression start to go away because they're actually feeling better. Yes. You know, and they're pulling their hair back and the boys are happy to go swimming and take their shirt off and, yes. you know, that kind of Probably thing. the best part about treating somebody acne is how people's self-confidence improves and how they look in the eye and end. And yes, it's a very, very rewarding part to acne therapy, especially with acne is, is yeah. that feature. So in case you're just jumping in, this is um, Dr. Craig Burkhart. We're just talking all things pediatric dermatology. So if you have any questions, let us know. Um, so what else, could, what are the common, big common things you see um, here as a pediatric dermatologist? Yeah, so I say acne, warts, eczema, um, hair loss, especially alopecia areata. Those, those are big ones. Um, psoriasis. Um, yeah, they kind of like warts have a lot of voodoo behind them. I kind of like to hear from people what, what voodoo they're trying. I've heard people try um, duct tape, of course. Um, there's, there's different cities have different wart whisperers. So I used to work in Burlington and there's a, a wart whisperer who used uh, um, peach tree leaves um, and you have to find them in the woods to get those peach tree leaves. Um, I haven't found out who the wart whisperer is in this area, so <laughs> if anybody online, online knows who it is, I'd love to have that information. And, and, um, I'll start to feel that way if people need some Sometimes whispering. if you don't know who it is, it might be you. Yeah, yeah, I, I have tried reading myself. I do, <laughs> do my own exorcism and hypnotism sometimes. Banana, Banana peels. Banana peels, yes. Yeah. Um, so what is it about warts that they're, they're so hard to treat? Like, you yeah. get a wart and it's like your friend for life. Like, yeah, what's right? going on with that? Especially those hand and foot warts. Those, those are really hard to treat. Um, yeah, so, so the theory is, is that you need your immune system to recognize the wart before it kills it. So you can do all the destruction, cutting it out, frying it, whatever. Um, but until your own immune system recognizes that it has a wart and decides it does not want it there, it's going to keep coming back. Because it's a virus. It's and a virus, yeah. There's no antibiotic that kills it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, the virus, no antibiotic. And, um, yeah. So if a, if, a, if a mom, dad brings their child to you for a wart treatment, yes. and they say, okay, I've tried this over the counter, I put this patch on here, yes. and I tried this freezy stuff, I've already yes. frozen it myself yeah. over the counter, like what are they going to come in and what are you going to do for them? Okay. Yeah, so it depends on their, your child's age and their, their pain tolerance and how, how much they want to go away and the maturity level. Um, so a lot of people come in expecting the liquid nitrogen, we call him Mr. Frosty. Um, so um, definitely can offer that to anybody, just have to realize. Which is very different than over the counter, right? Very different, much more cold. Um, and yeah, you'll notice it feels much colder. <laughs> so you have over the counter ones done, this, this actually does have a much colder feel to it. Um, and then any therapy we do, you have to recognize it's going to be two or three treatments. It's not just be one and done. Um, always expect it to be two or three for warts. Um, but that's one therapy. You can use lasers. Um, so some people come in having tried everything, including liquid nitrogen, and they want to have um, a certain laser. So CO2 and pulsed eye are the typical ones. Um, and you do pulsed eye light here, right? Yeah, pulsed eye and CO2. Um, for, for, you know, we can do that for warts. That's not my first line recommendation by any means, but yeah, we can do that. Um, Cream-wise, there's chemotherapy creams that's very common to be used. Something called 5 fluorouracil is a very common wart cream. It's inexpensive compared to other prescriptions, but um, it's still not completely inexpensive, inexpensive and safe for kids um, and painless. Um, man, we, we have lots of stuff. You can do immunotherapy, you can inject um, something called candida antigen under the warts, and that's, that's another um, way to stimulate the immune system and try to get to recognize the wart and kill it. Um, I was reading something um, recently about, um, and actually my the dermatologist had mentioned about um, like MMR studies. Okay, yep, so, yep. put that in there, yes. Yeah. You can get your wart vaccine, so if as a teenager, they're about time to get their, um, their HPV vaccination. So you can ask 
you can ask your pediatrician to inject it under the ward instead of the arm. Um, some, some people have done that and it kind of works. Um, you have to have a very flexible. <laughs> the pediatrician might be like, you have to have a very yeah. flexible pediatrician <laughs> to do that. Um, that. That's sort of hard. But that is, that is, that is another thing you can do. That yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. Um, okay, so we had questions about um, eczema in children also. And then we also had a question, just in case you're watching and waiting, so I apologize, um, about full body skin exams for kids when you start and based off family history or yes. whatever. So okay. um, the question we had about eczema was just, my kid has eczema, it doesn't get better. They've had all the testing. I think the mom had said something about, well, they've had all the food testing and they're negative. So yeah. what's the best thing for me to do? Gotcha. So if you're trying to find a trigger... Okay, so the first is yeah. to see a dermatologist. Because oh, yeah, yeah. they hadn't been to a dermatologist from what they said. And then I'm like, well, the first thing would be... Yes. Yeah, yeah. So it's always nice to see a dermatologist. <laughs> it is the skin. So it's like, yeah. um, so you kind of feel you're, you're kind of knowledgeable about that. Um, so yeah, so one thing is topical steroids are a nice way to shut things down and to confirm that it really is eczema. So, um, so one thing I, I like to do on the first visit is to make sure that you have tried a topical steroid and, and what it did for you over about a month, one month period. So if you used a strong topical steroid and it didn't clear it up, then maybe it is an eczema, maybe it's something else. So, so confirming that you have eczema is important. Um, I think that's an important point is that a lot of people think their kid has eczema and it's not eczema, it's, yeah. it's something else, and that's why they're just not getting better. And yeah. A lot of kids do have eczema, and a lot yes. of times it is eczema, and it's just, yes. they're just, it's, you know, they need yeah. more treatment, but... Yeah, yeah, no, it'll help if you, if you actually have seasonal allergies, and you actually do have food allergies where you swallow something and get bad hives, it probably is eczema, it's more likely, but if you don't have any of those symptoms, maybe it's something else. Um, and then full body skin exams, that was the other question that we got yeah. right away. Um, what do you, should parents be bringing, I mean, here we are, so you are open right now because you're yeah. in an essential office. You, yeah. He is new in Cary, yeah. and so um, it, obviously you're using precautions and you're only bringing in a few people yeah. every day and yeah. trying to keep things to turn over and trying to get your, um, you're doing virtual consults as well. Yes. So if um, people have insurance, I think you can even do insurance visits through virtual. Yeah, right? yeah. All so if they have questions about their kids' cross, acne whatever. or they need the refills yeah. or if they've never seen a dermatologist, yeah. then you're available. Yeah. Um, but also that, that full body skin exam, like when do kids need that or is it something that they need? Yeah. So um, before, be before adulthood, um, I would let your pediatrician help you guide you if you need to do a full body skin exam with a dermatologist. Um, so, so when you're when you see your pediatrician once a year for regular checkups, um, they usually do a really good check of your of your skin. If they are worried, then I then I definitely see a dermatologist and consider that that skin check. Um, if you have a strong family history of melanoma, um, say, say multiple first degree relatives, so mom, dad, brother, sister. I um, think that would be a good time to, to consider it as well. Okay. So they don't necessarily need to bring their six, six year old no. for a check unless they think there's something that the pediatrician is concerned about. Yeah, yeah. so I, I, I okay. work with a pediatrician. <laughs> if, if you know it's like a black bleeding lesion, you might you can start with a pediatrician, but that's, that's pretty obvious to me. I, I hope to the community too um, yeah. that, that that could right. be bad and you should see it. So yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, um, I'm trying to think of all the other, I want to make sure that I got your questions answered. Um, was there any other thing that you see like on a consistent basis that, what would be your one thing that you would say, this is the thing when it comes in, they should have come sooner or don't, don't try to treat this at home that you see <laughs> happen more often? Yeah. So most people are pretty smart. Um, yeah. I'd say managing illness or something that, that you should, should, should um, consider seeing someone sooner if it's on your child's face. So if you have a, a, a new baby and it has a red spot in the face and it's growing, um, then that's something you want to get ahead of earlier rather than later. There's lots of safe therapies to take care of those. Um, so, so you're talking about like birthmarks or what we call stork bites, right? Yeah, or or I mean, somebody else might know, yeah, you know, yeah. they kind of talk about that and some yeah. of them will fade, but some of them don't. Yes. And yep. so those are the hemangiomas that you're talking about. Yeah, so I said, yeah, so you have the, the hemangiomas that grow, they start off as like, they, they, got, they thought it was a bruise at birth, and then all of a sudden a 
month later, now it's a big red bump, and that, that, that's, that's that one. And then there's also the ones that are red when you're born and just stick around. Um, both of them, it's better to come in earlier um, rather than um, later. Um, one, just because if you do early treatment of lasers, um, you might prevent the child from ever eating anything after age one. Um, and the other one would be um, you can treat it medically um, and prevent them from ever needing any kind of procedure. Um, and so if, if, let's say, I have a child and they have this and they're six months old, is that too early to think about like maybe the medical management or? No, yeah, so, so medical management usually starts around two to four months of age. So yeah, and that's, and that's kind of like the worrisome thing about some of these, some of these hemangiomas is that you see your pediatrician typically at month two and month four, but in that, that two month span, sometimes parents, because it looked good at month two and the pediatrician told you it was normal, which, which was appropriate, um, but it grew during those two months and they just don't think to call a pediatrician or ask the dermatologist, is it supposed to grow this month much during that time? I guess that's my mind. And so when you were at UNC, you did a lot of laser therapy. Yes. So you're, you're, are you kind of like the guy for uh, hemangiomas? I like think I am. Yeah. <laughs> are you like the yeah. whisperer for, for those? I like to think so. Yeah. yeah. No, no. So yes, yeah, so that was my special interest of mine was vascular lesions and hemangiomas was, was, was my big interest at UNC. Um, and so obviously that was on my mind to bring, bring up to you uh, yeah. later. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So if you're a child or even a, as an adult, you, you do mostly pediatrics here. Yes. But, um, you know, there, there are options to treat that. And, you know, I, you and I had chatted. I have one on my arm, and I hit it one time with a laser, and my mom got upset and said, don't ever hit that again. That's your birthmark. And I'm like, ah, oh, you know. So when I do Facebook Lives or the short sleeve shirt, I always know somebody somebody's like, Jenny, did you know there's a mark on your arm? I'm like, yes, I know there's a mark on my arm. But it's different for, you know, someone if it's on their face. And it's yeah. a, there's a lot of people that it doesn't bother them at all. Yes. And, and that's yeah. completely fine, too. Yeah. And so they're not dangerous necessarily, yes. but they can become bigger, and it's yeah. easier to treat them when someone is younger, yes. is what you're saying. Yes, much easier younger. So it's on their face, on their neck. Um, is there any kind of, like, coverage for those types of treatments with, like, insurance? Or how yeah. does that work? Yeah, yeah. so there's, there's, there's codes that the insurance company will use to... To, to pay for the, the laser treatment. Um, and if you have to go to sleep, you can use those. It's usually covered as well to use that for, to, for that OR visit. Um, and if it's not covered by insurance, yeah, the, the, you can also pay out of pocket at, 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 a, right. at a reasonable price. Right. Okay, cool. Yeah. Any other questions or anything else you want to kind of say or bring up? What, what, what sort of things do you have at your, at your side of the office for, for, for Andy's? <laughs> I don't know what I do. Yeah, you know, all, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I think that, you know, like we had talked about, um, we do a lot of skincare and um, we treat, from my standpoint, when someone comes in with acne, we do a lot of the hands on therapies, we do the treatments for the, um, you know, chemical pills and lasers and things like that. We do some acne facials because, like, you know, I talked about, you know, you can wash your face all you want and use topicals, but sometimes, you know, we need to be their cheerleader, we need to get in there and clean their pores out for them, get them back to, okay, now your skin is clean, let's try to keep it this way, and, you know, just being their cheerleader and making, you know, teenagers and adults understand that, you know, we can make this better, and they can be doing everything perfect, and they're still going to have some breakouts. Like, they can't beat themselves up, you know, like, oh, I forgot to take my one pill, like, it's okay, like you said, it's not going to hurt. Of course, we want them to be compliant, right? But. Yeah. You know, it's, acne is just hard. It's yes. hard. It's really hard. But it's definitely worth treating and it's definitely worth sticking with because the scars are the, the problem down the road. And yeah. that, that takes more effort to treat that than it does. <laughs> yes. know, so that's yeah. tough. But, but you're here. We welcome you to the building. You. You're offering virtual consultations. You're offering yes. in-office yes. visits as well. Yes. Um, I know that you have been very safe. Um, about staggering your appointments, yeah. um, and so that's great. And yes. I, I've sent a couple people over just because they needed things that you know we're a medical spa and we just I, we just don't get into treating that, and that's your expertise. And so um, in this period of time, if somebody needs something, there are options. If you're you know I would say like if they have a teenager or somebody who's really struggling with acne and they're out of school right now, I mean at least consider talking to a dermatologist, whether it's Dr. Burkhardt or someone, this is a great time to try to get skin under control before summer because a lot of the 
medications, they can be photosensitive, and so it's a great time to take care of those kind of things. Mm -hmm. And um, get your skin checked. Yeah. Wear <laughs> so. your sunscreen, right? Yes. Yeah. When when should just last question? When should um, parents start putting sunscreen on their children? Oh, after six months of age is when you is when you start putting it. Um, I think be before then, before six months of age, you should keep them in the shade. Yeah. So no, just throw them out in the sun before six months. They're still protected, just not with sunscreen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, 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 don't, don't purposely tan your babies. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> All right, guys. If you have any other questions, you can send me a message. You can send Dr. Parker a message to your office, um, and then we'll try to get them answered for you. So have a great rest of your day, guys, and we'll chat soon. Thank you.